Well, it's really nice to see so many friendly faces here because in the blockchain space we're all working together and we're all collaborating. It's great to um, have all of you here. So I assume the room will probably fill up a little bit more when people have their coffee fix. Um, it's my great honor to welcome you all to the Horasa session on blockchain technology. I'm going to start with a couple of opening words. Why? I think blockchain is so important, but far more important for me is what I'm going to learn here today because we have a fantastic panel that uh, Frank and the Oasis team have brought together to address a lot of different challenges and opportunities the blockchain space will bring to all of us. So with that, welcome to our blockchain discussion. Oasis is focusing on global challenges and opportunities and blockchain technology squarely falls within that environment. While the underlying technologies that make blockchain technology possible are not new, but like cryptography, a lot of these things have been developed over the last 20 years. The new businesses, investment and collaboration models enabled by the technology though are still just emerging. Last year, we had an interesting panel on blockchain technology here at Horasis, and a lot has happened since then over the last 12 months. We had the excitement with finally some guidance from the SEC in the US. We had the bear market that might be ending now in the cryptocurrency space. And the value increase of coins and tokens has definitely taken a toll on a lot of investors but also entrepreneurs around the world. And last but not least, at CES, Gary Shapiro launched a fantastic book on blockchain called The Trust Technology and recommended it as the one book to read this year, written by Mark Müller-Eberstein. So I'm really honored to <laughs> present this to you. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important to understand the new financial models and financing models that the technology brings to all of us. We will talk in this panel about ICOs, the initial coin offerings. We'll talk about STOs, IEOs, um, equity investments in this space um, from an investor perspective, as well as from a governance perspective, looking at what the technology can do for whole countries. Just to give an example of what of the Horasis meeting last year, we met the former Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sami Badibanga and his team, while they were looking for a blueprint of how to bring transparency to the whole country. And we were fortunate over the year to work with them. And now that the elections have been settled and Badibanga is a senator in the, uh, in the Democratic of Congo, um, it's still influencing the policy and the politics of where that country might go over the next decades. Digital changing is one of those key things that we're talking in Oasis, in addition to all the other challenges, but I think they're all synergistic. Blockchain technology will, I believe, play a key role in the transformation of humanity. It will be as important as the initial inventions of ledger technology 5,000 years ago that brought us governance at all. It is at least as important as the intervention of double entry accounting 1497. That's the foundation of our economic, finance, and cooperation system we have today. I think blockchain technology, also called triple entry accounting, will create new ways of collaboration, economic value creation, not only for us, but for a vast, larger participation pool of the human population we have, unlock their economic potential over the next decades. This session will be uh, giving you an overview. We will start with an introduction and then I will lead to a list of questions that we're going to discuss as a group. We will open up the opportunity for all of you to please <coughs> join the conversation with short and precise questions and we'll try to make sure we address them all uh, so we can all leave much smarter than when we walked in here together. And I'm looking forward to learn for sure. With that, I would like to start and introduce this exquisite panel we have put together here for you. Let me start on my right with Johan Steil von Holstein out of Sweden. 
Hi, thank you. It's uh, great to be here, a great honor. And um, so I'm a serial entrepreneur. I was one of the first internet entrepreneurs in Europe back in the mid-90s and created uh, the largest internet consultants in the world, like Nikki Lab, and the first sharing economy company in the world, with Inspire.com. Um, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a technologist. I am interested in solving problems. And so, somebody said yesterday that the blockchain is a solution looking for problems. <laughs> I would completely disagree. I think there's huge amounts of problems and they are absolutely enormous. And that the, um, the blockchain will be credential and important in solving many of these problems. From my perspective, I've been a privacy advocate since 1998 when I called Google the most evil company in the history of mankind. And when Facebook came along in 2004, I said now they have a competitor. Um, I think it's enormously important that we own and control our digital footprint, our digital identity, and that we have the ability to monetize all the digital assets that we have in create. Um, in 1998, I said the most important thing for the internet is a fully integrated micropayment system. It is to me completely impossible to comprehend that we still don't have one. Um, and blockchain and Bitcoin will never be that coin. We need something else for that. So I think that although blockchain will be incredibly important, I don't think it is the tool to solve the problems that we have. It is part of the, of the solution. It is basically like the ARPANET released the internet in 1969. It was not the complete solution. It needed the World Wide Web. It needed integrated payment systems. It needed uh, transparency, acceptance from the larger group of, of audience. And there's a lot more to be wanted um, from the blockchain than what we can see today. However, I think that by getting transparency, ownership, and control, um, by being able to take more personal responsibility, as soon as they've got blockchain in order so that it's easy to use, easy to understandable, um, accessible, and implemented all over, it will be of tremendous importance for the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Johan. Okay. <laughs> Art, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. <coughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to be, uh, to be on this panel. Uh, so I am a hands-on technologist, and I have worked in Silicon Valley for 15 years at various companies, big and small. Uh, been founding member of uh, many startups over there. Um, and then I uh, founded a blockchain company last year uh, with two of my co-founders. And we are using uh, blockchain to bring transparency and sustainability to textile industry. So, so today, uh, there are a lot of issues in how sustainability is practiced uh, in various industries, especially uh, Textile. So the cost of doing sustainability is very high. Uh, part of it is because of the tools uh, that are available today. They are very cumbersome and they add a lot of overhead. So through blockchain, we are making it much, much efficient. So a lot of the points I'll be making today that are relevant to this, uh, to this group are coming from my personal experience implementing blockchain for a real world use case. So it has to do with working with regulators, working with industry stakeholders, and educating them like what blockchain can do for them. And then actually piloting these projects, these multi-stakeholder projects, and convincing them about how uh, blockchain can improve the current state of the art. Uh, so I'll be giving more points about that as we go. I'm looking very much forward to hear about the real world examples. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in San Francisco at the FinTech Innovation Forum and the head of Wells Fargo at that time uh, said we only have one functioning blockchain project within our company and it's done one transaction. Um, in the site salon, his head of innovation said we have hundreds of them going on already, which means the CEO wasn't really very well informed what's going on in his own organization and by the way, he uh, I think resigned the next day anyway. Not for that reason, but uh, he's not around anymore. <laughs> so yes, I'm looking very much forward to hear those examples. Please. Yuri. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone, and uh, uh, thank you everyone, and I'm really honored to have this panel with awesome speakers. Um, so I I am a founder of uh, two organizations. One is She Blockchainers, which supports inner inclusion in the blockchain space, 
uh, which is actually the first woman in blockchain community in Asia. Uh, and the second one is Amply, which is a communications agency working on with the blockchain industry. And uh, I help the companies like blockchain startups or blockchain or uh, growth level of companies to communicate in Asia. So I yeah, I bring in my knowledge from my diverse knowledge from technology understanding and uh, marketing or uh, communications and content wise understanding and as well as the finance related the understanding of knowledge. Um, and uh, so I think today uh, my Right now, my main focus is actually on digital securities and also the supply chain industry, which for me, in my understanding, it totally makes sense to apply the blockchain technology, no matter whether it's uh, finance or relevant to cryptocurrency or the technology and industrialized as in these cases. So uh, I have uh, my own uh, initiative, which I created a website. I wrote a lot of articles covering regulations in different countries in terms of token uh, or digital securities or tokenized securities if you can say um, and that's one thing that I have I'm currently running so yeah you can also check it out at mp.io you can go there and you can see a lot of there are a lot of articles that I have there and uh, with that I also collaborate with uh, security token ecosystem players so there are three uh, I think they are all these um, SEO relations platforms in the world. So Securitas, um, Polymas, and Swarm Fund. So I'm doing the content collaboration with them for, for this website. And uh, another thing is also I'm a, it's kind of informal announcement here. I think it's okay. So I'm a, I will be part of the, uh, I will be a blockchain lead in the deep tech uh, chapter in the, one of the international uh, logistics Organization association. So with that uh, in being involved, I will help to uh, bridge the knowledge gap in between the industry and also the blockchain technology providers. So that's kind of the work that I do and I'm really excited to share about it today. Looking very much forward. Kate, on my left side, Kate Mitchell's mother, please. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, my name is Kate and I'm the CEO and founder of Blockseller in BC, uh, which is a blockchain fund an accelerator headquartered in Seattle, Washington, uh, with the purpose of investing in 30 to 35 blockchain startups over the next four to five years. Um, prior to starting this fund, I spent 10 years with a global market research firm, Gartner. Uh, as a part of that, we have evaluated more than 100 different blockchain applications and blockchain implementations. And even though my primary goal as a fund manager is to produce returns for my LPs and for my shareholders, uh, the real reason why I'm interested in blockchain is because I think it has a massive potential to create an enormous amount of value and democratize that value for a wider population around the world. Uh, so just to give you a quick story, um, I was uh, born and raised in Russia, uh, in the Soviet Union, very much the opposite of a decentralized um, type of environment. Uh, both of my parents were aerospace engineers. And uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, they were out of jobs. Uh, so my mother uh, decided to go and start a business. She found one bank in my small hometown of 70,000 people, and that one bank had an interest rate of 100%. And that's the only option she had to go and grow capital. She did that, started a few businesses, a couple of them failed, and then finally, in 1998, she became successful. And that was the year of financial crisis in Russia. In 12 months, the ruble collapsed, uh, 30x, so it's within two years that she lost 60x, so she lost everything. Uh, many years later, when I moved to the US and I had found out about this new thing called the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies, I thought to myself, wow, wouldn't it be nice uh, for my mother to have her assets in something, not just the Russian ruble, and she wasn't allowed to hold US dollars, uh, but something that would hedge against the, the fluctuations of that, um, of that economy. And actually, two weeks ago, um, her bank, she's still living in the same small town, her bank froze all of her assets because the transaction exceeded $30,000. And there's absolutely nothing that she can do. So to me, blockchain is all about enabling the freedom, uh, the freedom of uh, financial choice, where you can go get your currency or your, your financial capital from, um, taking control of your business, supply chains, etc. 
Thank you, Kate. I think the opportunities are limitless, for sure, and the freedom and personal empowerment has a huge opportunity there as well. Last but not least, Michael Bryan is going to bring blockchain to a much, much broader environment, I think. Yes. And tell us a little bit more about the foundation, please. Okay, quickly, before I tell you about the foundation, how many people came here because they already know about blockchain and wanted to learn more? Raise your hand. How many know nothing about blockchain but would like to understand? Who understands blockchain as a ledger? Who knows who the ledger is? <laughs> second, second question. And who knows anything beyond that it's a ledger? Okay, that's what I thought. This is why I got started in blockchain. Actually, I began with Blockchain Ventures International. We began investing, uh, much like Kate, in early stage and seed stage blockchain projects. <coughs> then we got caught up in the ICO stage, and I served as an advisor to 10 or 15 use case blockchain uh, ICOs uh, in the supply chain industry, in the cargo uh, industry, in the intellectual property uh, space, uh, the music space, uh, several different spaces so that we could understand better before we invested uh, in what this really meant. We didn't know either when we started. It was a gamble. And we started going to companies and they began to ask us, we know it's a ledger, and what? What do we do next? And that seems to be the big question of a lot of companies, a lot of countries. They think they need to jump on board to the blockchain, but they don't really know what it means beyond the ledger. We need to be there, everybody's doing it. So Blockchain Ventures evolved into a consulting company that goes into corporate boardrooms and we provide workshops explaining in non-technical language, first of all, to what a blockchain is and how it works. How does it apply to our company or maybe it does not apply to our company? Are we wasting time and money uh, focusing on this? So this continued to evolve until several of my clients uh, asked, what will it take for everyone to be using blockchain and to understand it? There are several issues that are preventing mass adoption, that are preventing uh, full-scale uh, sustainability of blockchain. So some of my clients agreed to contribute money to form a foundation to address these issues. We find these issues to be security, scalability, some of these words you may not understand, they'll come up later in the discussions. Uh, scalability, a lot of people say, what is that? Um, Basically, it's transactions per second. Security is pretty obvious, not getting hacked, uh, not having uh, uh, bad actors getting into your blockchain. Uh, global standards is a big issue. We think it will not be adopted by mass populations until there are global standards. And with global standards, uh, once they're achieved, that alone does not uh, make it work. We need to also have interoperability between the 100 or 200 blockchains that are out there. Interoperability means each blockchain needs to be able to talk to each other so that people can have viable transactions and, and, and sustainability of the blockchain. Uh, beyond global standards of interoperability, we see privacy, especially with the European uh, GDPR, GDRB, whatever it is. The, the European regulations on privacy, these need to be addressed. Very difficult with public blockchains, and uh, there's some lots of work going on to combine public and private blockchains. And finally, and probably most relevant to everyone in this room, not everyone, but some of the experts and some of you who are more technically savvy uh, may not need this, but usability. Who remembers DOS in here? Raise your hand. DOS. DOS. You know, when you got your first computer, most of you are probably not old enough, but old guys like us, uh, we had DOS, and it's, you have to be a computer programmer to use it. This is where blockchain is now. To get to usability, we need, we need Apple and we need Windows. We need user interfaces. So these are all the issues that the World Blockchain Foundation is working on. Uh, we have recruited, we've, we've actually received pledges of $60 million. Our target is $250 million. Uh, we have a soft launch date of July 1st. We have no legal incorporation yet uh, because we are looking for a host country. We're talking to Switzerland, we're talking to several less developed countries, Gibraltar and Malta, all want to be the host country of the World Blockchain Foundation because they understand the importance of these things. And rather than talking and boring all of you much longer, uh, we invite everyone uh, to visit uh, on July 1st. Our website will be up, we have a temporary site now, but it's World Blockchain Organization, uh, sorry, World Blockchain Foundation 
.NET. And I emphasize .NET because there's another World Blockchain Foundation that's nonprofit that has a little bit more of a profit motive. We are purely nonprofit. We will spend $250 million to advance uh, the adoption and development of blockchain worldwide. And if you have companies involved in blockchain, we'd be happy to talk to you about investing in your project. If you're representing a country, we would be happy to talk to you about being a host country or a founder. Sorry for yeah, I think, speech. No, I think we have seen in the internet area how important global standards and collaborations are, and I'm excited to see what uh, you're doing, Michael, for sure. Um, bringing the rest of the room here in the, into the discussion, who of, may I ask, who of you owns cryptocurrency today or has owned in the past? Okay, so then on all of you, off behalf of you, I think prices really matter as an investment for sure. So let's do a very quick lightning round for the people here in the room. Imagine January 22. Will Bitcoin be over two thousand to two hundred? Uh, sorry, over twenty thousand dollars or not? What do you think? Yes, no. Over how much? Twenty thousand dollars, one Bitcoin. No. In twenty in, in twenty two, today we have five thousand. Yes. Sir. Yes. 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 I'm not allowed to give financial <laughs> <laughs> I think you're outside of the U.S. Isn't that okay then? <laughs> not at so all. Sure. No. No. The U.S. reach is global. Okay. Well, in that case, can I punt the question to you? As a I U.S. citizen, I have to, right? Question. Yes, I please. I'm a risk okay. Risk. So, I, I believe yes. it'll be in 2000, in 2022. I think it's overvalued already in 5000. Okay. And I think we will see definitely that the roller coaster will definitely be continuing, but um, there's a huge upside for sure in the long term. Um, but at the end of the day, does price really matter? Why does the price of a token why do we care about it? Or do we need to care? I think you're shaking your head, Johan. What do you think? I think it's of absolute non-importance. Um, I think, you know, I think in every circumstance, people are always looking at the money, following the money, instead of following the actual value creation. Every bubble that occurs is fantastic for society and humanity. Uh, it's just financial bubbles within different sectors where people who can afford to lose their money lose their money, or they shouldn't be in another space anyway. So I think it is of no importance. Um, I'm not even sure. I, I remember back in the days when Netscape had 98% uh, of the world's market and Alta Vista had a monopoly on search. So that might be Bitcoin and, and Ether. I have no clue. But the important thing is what um, cryptocurrencies and the blockchain can do for humanity, and that will go up to much, much higher valuations. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you measure that? Just <coughs> You know, it's, it's how we measure the value of the internet today after the internet bubble. Um, there was absolutely no internet bubble at all. It was a financial bubble within the IT sector. I don't think there was one day of less sent emails or less important views on IT security. So I think bubbles occur because greedy people with more money than they should have um, sees the huge underlying potential. So when the bubble bursts, that's when you're supposed to put all your money into it. I don't think that the Bitcoin has burst yet. It will go up and it will have its burst eventually, but it's not now. Let me punt the question over to uh, Paul. And you are coming from an environment where you think uh, logistics tracking is so important because it has a benefit to the population. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. So, so what we are doing today, I'll just explain the use case. So in the textile industry, there is lot of work that goes in to prove that something is organic, something is sustainable because there is a premium charge for it, right? The customer has to pay a premium. So if that is happening, then there better be like all the proof that really, really this so and so happened. So the way that is being done today is in a manner that is not well thought out in a uh, in an end-to-end comprehensive manner. There are all these regulations that are in place at various stages of the supply chain. And because of that, because of all these systems that don't talk to each other, the cost of compliance is very high. And this is basically results in the, the people who should be getting paid more are not getting paid enough, like the farmers, the factory workers, right, who are making these garments. They're not getting paid enough because the manufacturer has to uh, shoulder the burden of following the sustainability practices using the current sort of broken system, I would call it. So what, what we are doing is, we are consolidating these separate data silos in different parts of the supply chain. So in case of 
the organic cotton industry, what we do is we are going all the way from organic cotton seed till the finished garment. And at every stage <coughs> of the supply chain, we are aggregating all the proof that there is to, to prove that this is genuine organic. This was done using sustainable practices. So this proof could be in the form of certificates that are given by third parties today. There are a lot of certifying bodies in the, uh, in the fashion space. So they give out certificates. But then we are not stopping there. We are saying that why not go way beyond that? Like whatever is being uh, enforced today, it is simply not enough to prove that this is really sustainable, really genuine organic because people are creating fake certificates today. That, that is the truth. Like if you go to where these, these garments are being made, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, right? In these countries, it is not difficult to create a fake certificate. So what we are doing is, we are providing tools for the people <coughs> who are actually going and collecting this data to prove this is organic. We are building simple mobile-based tools where an auditor can go on the field, talk to the farmer, take a picture of the farmer and the field. We can track the GPS coordinates of where this, where this transaction happened that really somebody went to the farm and checked that everything is happening in a sustainable manner, in an organic manner, right? So this is not even required today. But we are going above and beyond. And the reason we can do this is because, is because blockchain makes it easy to, to, to do this level of this granular level of data collection at a cost that is very much acceptable. Because okay. transaction costs are really yeah, low, right? Really low. Yeah. May I, yeah, sure, may I make a comment on that that's very important? One issue, or one thing that everyone hears is the blockchain is immutable. The information is cannot be changed, therefore you know that, that the information is correct and accurate. But the problem is, we don't know where that information came from. The information that is input into the blockchain may not be, we don't know if it's true or not, we only know that that information was not changed. What Parth is presenting with his, his company seems to address this issue, so it's, it's a question a lot of people have. It's great, it's immutable, but what about the information that went in? How do we know that the truth was entered into the blockchain? That's will help. So that's a great, a great uh, product. So while, the yeah. Yeah, so while we're at the dark sides of blockchain, let's go a little bit deeper and get them out of the way in the first part of our conversations. Um, what about these hacks that you hear all about? Um, the security of blockchains itself. You said it's immutable, but we hear all this troubling news. Um, what's the real story behind it? Yeah. First, let me say, mm -hmm. hackable and immutable is two different things. Hackable means someone broke into the system, and typically with the hacks we've seen so far, hackers have hacked the exchanges of cryptocurrencies. Not many actual blockchain protocols or structures have been hacked, and, and this is what the public is, is being confused about. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I'm a little bit biased against cryptocurrencies because at the foundation we focus on blockchain, not on cryptocurrencies. Obviously, cryptocurrencies are part of the blockchain. And they're possibly, we're not sure yet, possibly an important part. So, immutable is one thing, hackable is, is different. So, maybe someone else. Can I add something? something? Sure. So, how many of you here know the concept of 51% attack? I'm sorry, 51%? 51% attacks. attacks. The concept of a 51% attack as right. traditional. Yes, yes. Yes. So, mm -hmm. most of you, or half of you, but the concept of a 51% attack is really fundamental to understanding the security of a proof-of-work algorithm that is behind Bitcoin and many other uh, blockchain assets. And the idea is, in order for you to actually hack a Bitcoin, you need to possess the hash power of 51% of all of the nodes or all of the computers that are calculating um, the algorithm that confirms the transactions on a Bitcoin. At the moment, the hash power of Bitcoin is the hash power of all of the data centers of Google, Microsoft, Amazon combined times 500. So in order for you to obtain 51% hash power of Bitcoin, it would cost you a lot of money. And once you obtain that hash power, it would not be in your economic incentive in order to break the Bitcoin because you would lose uh, the assets that you just acquired. So for that reason, Bitcoin is one of the only, you can call it a company, but it's one of the only companies in the world that hasn't been hacked. Can you think of a single company 
or a government in the world that hasn't been hacked in 10 years? No, I think the standard in the, in the security thing is you either have been hacked or you don't know that you have been hacked. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the security breaches happens at the gateway to access the Bitcoin. That's why exchanges get hacked. That's why you lose your private key, you lose your Bitcoin. But the fundamental protocol is very, very secure once it gets decentralized enough. You know? But I know this conversation is about blockchain. Yeah, but I think the key point is really for people to understand decentralization means there's lots and lots and lots of computers that are working together of managing a blockchain system, at least on a public blockchain system, the global system. Um, do you want to add anything, Yuri? So, mm -hmm. I think security is among the most important part in blockchain. From um, consumer's point of view, if you, there are some crypto exchanges that have been hacked a couple of times. and. Uh, over in the past 10 years. Um, so, yeah, so I think the custodian uh, and the businesses and also the uh, security part of um, area in the blockchain. If you are, uh, so if you are actually, I think today, we, most of the people in the room today, we uh, all, all of us actually have cryptocurrencies. So I think we are already pretty experienced in dealing with the crypto exchanges. When I initially started to do the crypto investment, I was actually, I made a lot of mistakes. So I had experience in attending the wrong address and uh, I lost my like, password, those things. So uh, from the consumer point of view, actually, the security, uh, like, you, you know, how to, how to manage your like, private key and those things is actually very important. But also in terms of the business perspective, um, I think uh, the coming, Changing the topic a little bit to the logistics industry, there are like big uh, discussions in terms of you know whether to keep it in the private private blockchain or the public blockchain. So uh, there are you know technology providers focusing on developing the, the private blockchain part of it, so without uh, considering the public blockchain and so on. So there are like small uh, tech providers only focusing on particular industries. Like one a company working on telecommunications industry on itself, and another company working on uh, focusing on the airlines industry. So all these technology providers, when they, uh, business, uh, businesses are adopting this blockchain technology and it works, and then at the same time, you know, the security as a cyber security perspective has uh, worked together, and then we can actually enhance the system, in, in terms of the, enhance the blockchain system applying to the enterprise space. Yeah, so traditionally though, when the term, term cryptocurrencies and blockchain comes up, one of the things we always get confronted with is, what about money laundering? Um, isn't this all just for criminals? Who other than me has a strong opinion on that topic? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, it is, cash is used by criminals um, quite often. But it doesn't mean that the cash should be banned as a means of transfer of money. Essentially, what you're dealing with is a more efficient way to transact cross-border. And in fact, when you're using a blockchain, you're not, you're not anonymous, unlike popular belief. You have a specific hash attached to your transaction that can identify who you are and track you much, much better than if you were to be transacting with cash. So it's a, it's a misconception, actually, right? Is that, is that a fair statement? Correct. Yes. Uh, there are obviously mm -hmm. exceptions there where you have privacy coins, and mm -hmm. privacy coins are developed for exactly that reason to sh shield the transaction uh, amount as well as who the transaction is coming from. So, every, so if everybody in the blockchain space is such good people, why then are happening all these manipulations on the exchanges, the pump and dump schemes? How, 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 how do we deal with those and those not so nice aspects of the blockchain world today? Regulation, uh, to an extent. I think we're working in an extremely immature industry uh, that is just trying to find its feet. Um, and inevitably, we will have bad people and bad actors playing in that industry. So there's a lot of conversation about self-regulation. And to an extent, it has to happen. There will always be bad actors, and in order for us to make sure that the good actors stay in business, we need some guidelines or some clarity as to how the good actors should operate in this space. And unfortunately, in the U.S., 
there's lack of that clarity today. I think that the internet went through the same process when it came through in the mid 90s. It was all about how bad people were using it for bad things. But it, it doesn't mean, even if it would be a high percentage in the beginning, it doesn't mean that this is not a really good thing for good people when the good people get onto it. And um, lawmakers and the police and stuff, they should solve the problems, not try and prevent people from using really good stuff. But, if everybody, if nobody in the Western world would need a single Bitcoin, just consider the people living in countries like Venezuela, or Zimbabwe, or Argentina, or endless amounts of other countries where they have suddenly huge deflation. And um, so, this is a good product with, with some bad people using it, but it goes in the same thing with every product and part of the society. I think, I think this is one point to Kate and. I think the regulation should take place to, you know, to prevent from uh, over behavior. But uh, at the same time, I think we need to take it uh, not too much limiting the opportunities and the uh, availability. So uh, there are some like, you know, in a regulated way, there are like market making activities you can actually allow to do it so that, so that it can actually more, more liquidify and more give you more um, like supporting uh, the, the industry and also the, so the availability of, of the token itself. Aren't there some inherent issues so with cryptocurrency, especially around volatility, to use it as medium exchange in a business environment? Um, but the big fluctuation we have seen, I think, and partly benefited from as well, um, it makes it difficult for businesses to actually do transactions on cryptocurrencies. Until quite recently, I think uh, there's a lot of concepts that's called a stable coin. And I know Kate's organization put a white paper out, so maybe you can explain what is a stable coin and why does it make sense for the people in the room. Sure. So uh, think about all the craze that we have with cryptocurrencies. A lot of people purchase assets and then they went up 10x and then they lost everything. So over time, the concept of stable coins emerged, which essentially states, instead of you transacting in an asset that is not pegged to a stable form of currency or a basket of currencies, uh, you know, you need a mechanism to still have this access to the digital currency that is easy to transact, cross borders, but has this stability around it. So we have put together research uh, over the past few months. We've learned there's three types of uh, stable coins in the market today. One is pegged by uh, US dollar currencies. One uh, pegged by collateral. Collateral could be uh, actual cryptocurrencies themselves, such as MakerDAO in case of Ethereum. Uh, and then there is a third type, which is algorithmically trade. Uh, all, all algorithmically backed uh, stable coins. And the idea is instead of you're still entering this, uh, you're getting the benefits of what the cryptocurrencies provide, which is frictionless exchange cross border transactions, but you're not liable to the fluctuations that cryptocurrencies typically entail. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, what, anybody want to add on the stable coin topic for? Yeah. yeah. No, I think the. Uh, stable coins or, or also STOs, right? The asset backed coins, they are a necessary first step to get mass adoption of cryptocurrencies. So, right now, because a lot of people, businesses, they don't understand the value of cryptocurrency, there is a lot of volatility. So, so as a, at least as a stop gap solution, uh, such coins uh, should be created uh, till the market and people are comfortable with the idea of trading in crypto. So that will start the commerce going, and maybe at a certain point when people are convinced and comfortable, there can be clients that will need to be packed to something else they themselves have that. Well, you mentioned the term STO or security token offering, and I think that's a good segue in the next part of the discussion about investments in equity. Uh, traditionally, as investors, we know equity, we know collect about that debt. There are some instruments we're familiar with, but the crypto world has created new ways of fundraising. It started with like Kickstarter, where people just uh, contributed to a specific project that turned into the initial coin offerings, the ICOs, and all the craze that was going around this, I think in general, good concept of global fundraising for communities and turned into mostly uh, fraudulent or um, sometimes incompetent people raising money from uh, sources that probably shouldn't invest in those spaces. Um, but I think it's creating very new ways of investments. And I think uh, 
Yuri, you have uh, a very strong opinions on the STO environment. Maybe you can explain to people again what is an STO and uh, where where are we going from here? Um, so STO is a uh, abbreviation of S a security token offering, um, but the terminology wise, it's uh, in the US, it's uh, it's called as digital securities, and in some parts of the world, it's also called like tokenized assets and so on. So, DSO for US terms, T, uh, TAO, like TAO, and then STO, all these are actually they are basically the same thing. So, what is security token or digital securities? Is uh, so it's quite simple. Security token is um, is a token representing securities like bonds, like equity and stocks, and some um, alternative financing products. Um, but the difference of difference and the benefits of this uh, security token is that um, it is uh, it represents the programmable regulations, so that uh, it can enable the automated compliance or the regulation framework management uh, that is applied to the securities, whoever wants to tokenize. So yeah, that's, the, that's the, the definition of the security token. Um, so here, what, what it differs from the traditional securities to, uh, to the tokenized securities is that this, uh, we, need to, we need to talk about the blockchain advantage. The blockchain is, as it said earlier, the blockchain is immutable. The data record that is uh, that is saved in the, in the chains. So, um, security token. A lot of um, there are some hyped kind of way of people saying in the in the in online people talk a lot about the security token. So this uh, this security token topic has been covered quite a lot since like late last year. So a lot of people talk about the vendor security token is like uh, liquidity and um, and some uh, like easier way of like it's alternative or ICO. So in that sense, um, so ICO and STO are two different topics. So ICO is more for it's actually presents to represents crowdfunding because all the retail investors can jump in and they can participate to it. Um, so ICO has its benef own benefit as in democratizing the investment opportunity so everyone can actually have the benefit of what the traditional VC industry has. But uh, STO is actually, um, in my opinion, it's just two different topics. So STO is more for applicable for the growth stage companies. So it's not really for the seed level of the very earlier stage of the company because they don't have any equity value. So let's say the company wants to tokenize their equity or share, they have to show the proof the value of the share to the investors, right? But they you just created a company like six months ago, so there's no value. So um, so in my opinion the STO like who can the STO is more for the first stage company who has been running the business for some time so that they have uh, the valuation and those companies who wants to uh, keep the company private, but also at the same time, um, you know, instead of running the IPO, the STO can be one of the alternative, alternative options to liquidify the company. So that's kind of the difference between the uh, ICO and STO. And uh, why I believe that digital security is, is making sense is that, um, so it's fully complied, so there's no argument over regulation, there's no risk taking uh, opportunities. But uh, but it also makes sense for me that um, there are still gray area in terms of regulation. Like you still have right now, you still have to apply the current existing regulations in terms of securities. But at the same time, there are some gray area that still regulators and ecosystem players and also business like startup owners can also help negotiate negotiate in some way so that you can actually make the environment a little bit better, better than previously. So I'm based in Singapore. So Singapore has a good, um, uh, Singapore and also actually Switzerland has a very good um, uh, guideline in terms of security token. Um, so Singapore, in, yeah, in, in Singapore, currently the security token guideline is actually a little bit giving more opportunity for uh, qualified investors but the glory, but the higher, uh, uh, sorry, the higher of the barrier for the retail investors 
So basically, what they are like, intending to do is to protect the retail investors, but also give them opportunity for qualified investors who are more educated in terms of the investment. So that's the. Can I add something? Um, so, just kind of a, before we get into the nitty gritty with uh, STOs and ICOs, I just want to take a step back and kind of give you folks an idea that we are going through massive transformational capital markets today. So, think about 100 years ago when we were going through Industrial Revolution and we had the Carnegie, the Vanderbilt, the Rockefeller build their big enterprises. For the most part, they retained 100% ownership in that company. Uh, very few of them had any external investors, and if they did, they would have owned 1% and the owner kept 99% of that asset. Uh, fast forward to the internet age, the dynamic of that market has changed, where now we have shareholders, so for example, take Uber, uh, which is valued at $70 billion today, but most likely going to go IPO at 120. 45% um, of Uber is owned by investors, including the owner, and 45% or 55% is owned by employees. So if you take the current valuation and divide it by 12,000 employees, on average each employee would have earned $2.8 million. So there's a huge democratization of value capture that's happening towards the internet age. And what I think we're talking about here with this new model of blockchain, be that STO or be that ICO, is that democratizing that value capture even further, where if you're an Uber driver and you can earn and be paid in actual shares of the company and accrue the value as the company accrues value, then you would be much more motivated as an employee of that company compared to somebody who doesn't have any stake at all. So I think we're gonna see a complete change to the capital markets where IPOs are going to be less and less relevant, STOs are going to move down to the Series B, maybe even Series A stage, um, and it will create this democratization of value capture that I'm talking about. We would like to see more tokenization of traditional assets as well. I mean, it's uh, interesting when we buy an Apple share today, it's actually recorded in some Excel spreadsheet by some broker, and because there's only certain hours of the day that we can trade it potentially on a one market. Um, with the digitalization and the tokenization of assets, we are having access to 24 by 7 global markets of trading for um, assets that were too costly to trade today, and as you just said, giving opportunities and democratization opportunities for huge parts of the population to participate in the economic system, that's for sure. Mark? Yes. May I make a few comments? We're talking a lot about, we're talking a lot about ICOs, uh, STOs, and digital currencies, or cryptocurrencies. I'd like to bring it back a little bit, if possible, to blockchain, because this is not really a cryptocurrency uh, seminar, although many of you here may be here to hear about cryptocurrency. So it's important information. It's an important part of blockchain. But you already mentioned there's a lot of gray areas with, with regulators in Singapore, in America, everywhere, all over the world. We don't know. Uh, not only we in this room are not clear, but regulators don't know. As an example, Yuri and I had dinner with a gentleman last night uh, who's in a lawsuit uh, involving uh, cryptocurrency mining, which is the creation of blockchains. And in this lawsuit, the judge has no knowledge of blockchain or, or cryptocurrencies. The juries have no knowledge. So they brought in an expert to, to make clear. Well, the judge at the end of the expert's testimony, a university <coughs> professor who understood algorithms and blockchain, finished his, his uh, his presentation, and the judge said, I'm only more confused. And this is the problem with regulatory uh, equality or, or uh, stability around the world. Nobody understands what it means, and we're in a very early stage. And cryptocurrencies have taken front stage. And a lot of people have lost a lot of money. People are, uh, you know, liberals on the left are saying this is taking advantage of poor people. Conservatives on the right say there's too much regulation. So we're in a very disruptive stage of understanding, not only disruption in the markets. So as far as regulations, we need to make it more clear. We in the industry need to, to cooperate more with regulators and, and meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. The SEC, which has a terrible name uh, around the world, is being uh, vicious and, and attacking people. They're actually they've, uh, created a division uh, to help take feedback from people in the industry. We need a lot more of this in every country. 
Uh, work together, not against each other. Don't see the regulators as the opponents, but as the people who can help enable and help help bring uh, mass utilization and mass adoption of the blockchain. And it's up to us to help the yes. regulators with the education. I think that's we're working with the state of Washington uh, very, very closely. We've seen, I think, Singapore, Malta. They see the potential for their economies, and they're trying to reach out and bring things together. But I think, Johan, you want to add something? Yeah, I want to add something about um, I mentioned before that bubbles are always good. The very first financial bubble recorded in there for man was the tulips in Holland in the 1600s. And people always laugh at that. But the fact is that during the tulip trade industry, before the bubble, they invented the stock exchange. The Amsterdam Stock Exchange is the oldest in the world. They also invented bonds. And bonds have created hundreds of billions of values to humanity around the world ever since. 400 years after the so-called bubble in the tulip industry, Holland still stands for 80% of the global tulip production. It's the third largest industry in Holland. And through to the, due to the knowledge of the tulips, um, Holland is the second only to America uh, largest exporter of vegetables in the world. And the second largest industry in Holland is tourism industry, who basically build, go there in spring to take photos of the tulips. <laughs> so the bubbles are always fundamentally good. The, the, the problems that are created at the beginning, when people think that what well, bonds was bad, but look at the tulips, look at the horrible stock exchange in Amsterdam, good comes out of the turmoil that is always needed in the beginning of their industries. Yeah, somebody I think that's just redistribution of money from the wealthy, not so smart people and greedy people to the entrepreneurs that are trying to build cool things, right? <laughs> and sometimes they succeed, sometimes they don't. And if they don't succeed, it's always good because the failures or the, um, the lessons, yeah, actually pushes evolution forward. You learn from them, you don't do the same mistakes again, and other people take on and do those inventions. I want to take up the, the, the comment you just made regarding blockchain for other use cases. And I think uh, coming from Davos for the last few years, one of the big topics there is the opportunity for the billions of people that do not have access to identity system and ownership systems and where blockchain can help. Um, I think uh, uh, you may, I think where you are going, it's probably going the first step in that direction. Um, you want to jump in? Yeah, that's true. So, so for a blockchain system to really be effective, and I'm talking about again non-crypto uh, use case, so in my uh, scenario that we are solving with blockchain, identity is very, very important because we want to record at every step of the supply chain who did that transaction, right? So for that, we need identity. We need digital identity for like various actors. We want to create this all the way till the farmer level also. And then blockchain makes it easy and cheap to do this. Uh, so uh, digital identities, uh, are traditionally like they're very expensive to implement the way it has been done before, but blockchain has completely changed it, made it extremely easy. So in our case, I'll just give a quick example. So when, when an auditor goes to the field to basically check if everything is happening the right way, the identity of the auditor is used to sign that transaction. That okay, it's like me, uh, like I have verified that this field and this farmer is doing it the right way, so I give them a thumbs up, right, and immediately the digital identity of the auditor is put there on the ledger permanently. Nobody can change that, ever. And also, in that same transaction, we can incorporate the identity of the farmer. That actually, indeed, this person went there on the farm and actually spoke to them, and they also have added their identity to this transaction. So this is how we're doing at every stage, and this is what uh, makes auditing uh, really powerful. When something goes wrong, we can go back and see why this went wrong, like who actually did this transaction, and how can we prevent this from happening in the future, right? And today, the way things are done, I mean, information is just entering this massive databases mm -hmm. without uh, each transaction <coughs> being tagged with identities. Or, or in some cases, actually, you can go in and you can go and tamper that record. You can even go and change, because it's just a column in a database. Like, you can go and say, okay, this action is actually not done by this person, but somebody else. Right, you can do that today. But with blockchain, that'll be very different. I don't know if it's green. Do you want to have mine? Yeah. Here we go. Oops, sorry. Okay. I didn't forget where I was going to say. Awesome. This is going to work. Uh, 
Uh, well, so what I wanted to say is that uh, we're moving towards the self-sovereign identity component, which is instead of government owning your identity, which traditionally has been the centralized entity, to verify who you are, to verify where you come from, how old you are, how much money you have. Now, the idea is the decentralized application for cryptography can verify that. And with uh, zero-knowledge proofs, which is a new cryptographic uh, term, you don't actually have to reveal any details about yourself other than do you qualify uh, within a certain criteria, such as you're about 18 years old or you have X number of dollars in the bank in order to purchase that particular asset. But I think the bigger picture here is that, and I like to make references in history because I think it sort of shows the trend of where we're going, and if we think 300 years ago, the Queen of England had to uh, authorize the phone line between London and New York. And then 200 years later, we have corporations who are now able to put those lines in place. Uh, every government service that we know of today will be offloaded to not just the, the, the hands of the corporation, but to the hands of the decentralized application. Because blockchain provides that capability, you don't need the government anymore to tell you whether you own the land. And as a matter of fact, a lot of governments don't want to deal with that issue. They don't want to be responsible and liable for uh, lack of transparency or the corruption that happens within that government. They don't want to be responsible for managing your identity if they don't have to. They don't, have to, they don't want to be responsible for managing your data on your behalf if they don't have to. So think about, um, yes, we're here today, 2019, but 2030 plus, what if the services that the governments provide will be obsolete altogether, and we can just offload it to this decentralized protocol that can self-govern itself? First, first, a response to what Kate just said. We are finding governments telling us the opposite, that they would like to keep this responsibility because they don't want to lose the control. So there is a conflict between what maybe is idealism and what should happen. So we need to, we need to bring that closer to the, together so the governments don't feel that they're losing control and that people aren't so dependent upon the government. Uh, the governments are very uh, reluctant to give up control and power and money. So I think it's 2030 and beyond before we, we get to, to see that in reality. But I wanted to make a point that Parth, uh, he made a very important statement in a sentence, in the middle of a sentence, that no one or a few of you might have called. And that is, when something goes wrong down the road, we can go back and find out where the transaction happened. He said we can put data in the, you know, he can audit, that a certain transaction took place, that yes, it happened, but he doesn't know for sure. We don't know that he wasn't bribed by the farmer to put incorrect information and say this lettuce was actually good when it was rotten. But when it gets further in the supply chain, and someone will complain because they take responsibility, we can then go back down and identify. So along, this answers my statement earlier that we don't know about the information, if, if, if it's correct or not. But someone down the road in the chain, and we're reducing that chain with the blockchain, by the way, it'll be much easier and faster. We'll find when uncredible information has been put into the, into the blockchain. So auditors can, be, can also be corrupt, but we can find out and find that auditor with the blockchain. Sorry. So I'd like to just respond to that. So the, the problem of uh, corruption, right, and the problem of bad data entering the blockchain, I think that is not necessarily a technology problem, that is a systemic issue, right? So blockchain cannot like automatically fix all the problems of the society. Like those things have to be addressed through like proper regulation and oversight, right? And it's human nature, right? So people are, will try to do something wrong, whether it's blockchain or not. So I think like blockchain is a system to enable uh, doing something in a very efficient manner or, or as efficient as possible. That is, Right, but the perception with many people and the perception that many blockchain proponents are putting out, that it does cut out corruption, that it's the answer to all, all problems and everything will be true and correct. But there will be problems, but the blockchain will not solve them. It will help identify them much faster and make, make, uh, help eliminate corruption in that way. Blockchain itself will not. 
but it will help speed it up. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to remember blockchain gives us the tool to enable you know the transparent and immutable environment for the business business operators. But as earlier I mentioned about the organization and security <coughs> or the logistics industry identification and self sovereign uh, all these all these are actually the use cases of blockchain. So what we need to remember is that blockchain is a tool that can enable uh, you know, a very transparent and a trustworthy environment in the business. Yeah, I think you want to just, just a short remark on uh, the privacy issue of having the state or yourself owning your details. It's interesting to see how it's all the Eastern Bloc countries, Russia and Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, all of these countries are more um, engaged the fact of getting your freedom and your rights because they know when bad governments go bad, you don't want them to know anything. <coughs> And the more naive Western world, we think, well, well the governments are good, and uh, they have to be so right now, but what happens if they go bad? So uh, let's hope that, that individuals win these fights. I have a long yeah, list of questions here, but I saw two people raising their hand free at this point. I think the gentleman on the first here, can you please just get close to a microphone <coughs> for you to raise your question? It's not a question, it was just a comment. Uh, one thing that I would have loved to see on the panel was also how blockchain is enabling uh, funding scenarios where initially uh, fundraising was not possible. And so I'm involved in some projects where, say, Nigeria recently changed a regulation where natural gas cannot be burnt anymore. It has to be now, you know, compressed, transported, and and, uh, and utilized within the country. Uh, with that, but uh, but the, due to the hyperinflation that Nigeria is going through, there, is no, there are no funders for this project. So with the STO like platform that you mentioned and you mentioned about you know the global capital flow and how much of that is possible. Uh, but with the STO like platform where investors are protected with the downside with the assets backing backing the tokens, uh, there are suddenly lots of opportunities for emerging markets or even like Africa is not even I would say emerging market, but ignored markets are getting an opportunity to raise capital from global investors. It's going to fundamentally change the face of this world yeah. and democratize for good, I think. And raise the visibility as well. I mean, it's not if you reach out to the global community for fundraising, it also raises visibility for specific yeah. issues, projects, and so on. Absolutely. Uh, the lady in the back, please. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding about what self-sovereign identity means and how it works. It doesn't eliminate governments issuing identities to people. In fact, they're the leading, um, the province of British Columbia, the province of Ontario and Canada, the US Department of Homeland Security are all investing in self-sovereign identity technologies. The critical thing about the tech is that it issues to citizens uh, identification that's under their control and that doesn't phone home to the state. And it's completely wrong that Estonia is empowering its citizen. Every time you use your Estonian ID, it phones home to the Estonian government and it knows where you use it. And the issue with that, the, what self-sovereign identity tech does is it means you can use your identity and it doesn't tell the state where you use it. It just checks the signature on the ledger to see if it's a valid ID or not. So I just wrote a book on the topic and you can go and find it on Amazon because we really have to get clear about what these things do and what they don't. I, d I didn't say that the Estonian government uh, was doing anything good. I'm saying that the people of Estonia and the Eastern Bloc are very much into trying to find ways of having identities without them being controlled by the governments. But their whole ID system is controlled by the government. So there are, and there are centralized ID systems. There are also decentralized ID systems for like, so refugee camps in Jordan um, that are creating ID systems just for a specific purpose. So there's a variety of models out there right now, government-sponsored, independent identities. And there are areas where people do not have any access to a government ID. So if five or six people globally can vouch for the person, that might be better than a dysfunctional government somewhere, right? So I think that you have wanted to jump in here. Yes, absolutely. Um, just a quick question. Uh, I thought that um, the uh, example of Uber was, was an excellent one to just try to, to show the democratization of value. A couple of things coming from the finance side but the techie side of things. Value and valuations are two different things. Okay? Just because something has a valuation doesn't mean it has a value or the other way around. Totally agree. Called EOS, I think. Okay. <laughs> oh, Ripple? Uh, 
Yes, <laughs> exactly. Second of all, and this is also the discussion you guys had about, um, about how do I know that the auditor that put in for the farmer was actually not corrupt? Once it's on the blockchain, we think it's a trusted thing, it's a smart contract, whatever, we are in an ecosystem of trust. Um, there, if you then put the discussion you were raising about, um, you know, when you have a participation in the company or in that ecosystem as an invested interest through a cryptocurrency, your farmer would make sure that he will not bribe, for example, the auditor. So my question here is, does the, the technology of blockchain and the introduction of cryptocurrency does something to the way we govern, we have governance system in the business um, and actually the, 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 the modus operandi in business in general. Will it change corporate culture away from corruption? Perfect question. It takes one off my list, but uh, please. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So the way we are looking at uh, sustainability in the, uh, in the textile industry, is by incentivizing all the people involved. So the point that you made, that is excellent. So we are figuring out a way where we can uh, combine all these different pieces of this big ecosystem and create an incentive for people who are really doing the right thing, like the farmer, right? If he uh, is incentivized, he or she is incentivized in the right way, they will have less reason to bribe someone. And this is exactly what we are seeing is not happening today. Like people are trying to solve sustainability in the way of punishing if you do something wrong. But they are not looking at it by how can we incentivize instead of punishing people, right? So, so we are working with some banks uh, in, in Singapore where they have capital to be deployed into businesses who can prove that they are sustainable. We are working with brands who have CSR budgets which they want to put back in the ecosystem and they want that money to reach the farmers, you know, all the way. So, so we are looking at it the way carbon credits work, right? So, so we strongly believe that, that very soon there will be a concept like sustainability tokens or sustainability credits. So farmers who are doing the right thing today, they will be able to earn these credits, these tokens, and then big brands and businesses who are net negative in terms of sustainability will have to buy this from the farmers, pay them money to obtain these tokens, right? Carbon trading. Exactly, it is exactly like carbon trading. So, so I strongly believe this is gonna happen in the next five to 10 years, there will be strong regulation to make this happen. And, and for that, they need a very efficient technology. You can't use the current systems and even the carbon trading system today, it's a mess. Like it is not being done the right way. The tracking of it is like in a very hand wavy manner. I was talking to someone just in this conference and she was telling me how bad it is. So we need a technology like blockchain to enable this and we need a way to incentivize everybody in the value chain to do the right thing. I just wanted to one thing, um, kind of a far-fetched thought, but we talk about the trend of urbanization that's happening today. More and more farmers, small business owners are moving outside of their small cities because they are squeezed by the uh, margins, or their margins are being squeezed by large corporations. And a lot of them are farmers. And we see the cities that are overflowing with people and they can't keep up with the, with the services that they should provide. So what if we could reverse that trend or slow down that trend by giving the farmer more control over their financial future. A lot of them don't even have the paperwork for the land that they own. They don't have the land title. They have inherited that land from their grandfather and they've never gotten formal paperwork because maybe their government is corrupt as well. And that means that they cannot participate, formally participate in that economic infrastructure or economic opportunity, we cannot borrow against that land. Now, think about tokenization of assets. What if we can tokenize their land, tokenize their cow, borrow against them, um, create cash flows that they wouldn't be able to, and how it's going to impact that trend of organization that we think about today. Regarding empowerment, I think the lady from the United States yeah. had a question. Actually, I'm the one who knows the word blockchain and crypto, but I don't understand at all. 
how it works, what it will be. And I'm confused now because I have heard many things you have told me. Now I understand a bit more. And my question actually would be leading to what I'm doing today is I'm a CEO of a big charity foundation. And my question would be how it is it will be or, or already now beneficial to charity uh, in general. How it can make uh, the, the donors to be attracted to this or that foundation to bring the money? How I can actually be in a advantageous position to get more money uh, to our charity foundation and to be sustainable and to be safe from different um, situations when the money is being corrupted or in another way. So basically, whether it is beneficial movement and how charity in general, philanthropic industry in general, can be, uh, become more beneficial of this. So my short answer would be blockchain technology for all kinds of organizations can add a lot to transparency that is within the organization and for the people that are interacting with the organizations itself. Um, but I think you, like you wanted to add no, something. No, no, that's good. good. Okay. <laughs> good. Uh, in any case, I we have a couple more questions. That's why I wanted to make sure. Yeah. I can give a, a quick uh, example. So there's like, this company in Ellis. They are doing. Uh, it's a public blockchain, but uh, they they are using smart contract. Smart contract is like something that you can automate the management processes, so that you can simplify the the charity processes in uh, using this kind of platform. That's one example. And the another uh, example is that you know the, you can directly connect the donors and receivers uh, using the blockchain technology. So that's kind of just a simple example that I can share with you. May I clarify that a little bit? I just this will turn on. Uh, sure, you can deal directly, but you can do that now without the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of people's questions are. We can call mm -hmm. a donor directly; they can send it to our bank account. But what will the blockchain do for charities? We're working with Care USA right now, and we are looking at ways to shorten the supply chain, put more accountability within the, within the supply chain. We bring transparency at all ends. The corrupt people at the end of the, of, of, I don't know, are you with the United Way, I guess? United Way in Russia. Yes, yeah. United Way in Russia. Regulation is awful. Yeah. Yes, I live Not in Moscow. To say about I, this. I understand yeah. Russia's regulations, <laughs> unfortunately. But, yes, uh, we're dealing with them to provide accountability at every step of the supply chain, to reduce the supply chain, and to have an audit trail of everything that takes place. I don't know if you're dealing in some less developed countries where corruption is a lot less under control, although all countries, uh, big and large, here, we're from Moscow, we know. Uh, we all have corruption, but it seems to be a little bit hard to control in some countries. And the auditability and accountability provided in the shortening of the supply chain reduce the possibilities of corruption and, and I'm not sure if your care has a lot of corruption at the end of their at the end of their uh, supply chain uh, at the recipient end and their donors are not getting what's being contributed so we're devising ways to help them provide that accountability so it's not just in, in sure as Yuri said you can also reduce transaction costs uh, in receiving your donations, cost and speed of, of receipt. I'm not sure speed is such a big issue. Uh, receiving money from the charity, at least we're finding out what our foundation is.